delighted to speak to you today. Congratulations um, to you, to Nano Nagel Place, to your team for winning the 2022 Council of Europe Museum Prize. What an honor, and I'm so excited to learn more about your institution today. Thanks so much, Sarah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be here as well and to share in the Nano Nagel Place story and tell you about the journey we've been on. And yeah, we were absolutely delighted to win the Council of Europe Prize. So happy to share in all aspects of that. Wonderful. So as I said, I'm here with John Smith, who's CEO of Nano Nagel Place. Um, just won a huge award for um, many projects institution wide. And I think that's really what I'm curious to hear more about the layers of your organization, your community focus, how you have uh, taken the history of the woman, of the place, of the town, and really created something special. Can you tell us more about Nano Nagel Place? Can you, and can you tell us more about what makes it so special? Absolutely, delighted to. So I suppose really um, the story of Nano Nagel Place, in a sense, uh, is what makes it special. So if you go back like almost 250 years ago to a woman, in, a, you know, a pretty wealthy, you know, woman from a, a family that were, were, you know, well off at the time, a, a Catholic family in Ireland. Um, and she was um, living uh, about 20 miles outside Cork City. And, um, but she was living at a time where education was forbidden for Catholics in Ireland. It was called the penal laws. So she herself was educated in a hedge school initially and then was um, got further education, I suppose, the equivalent to secondary school um, in France. Um, and to move on the story, then she came back to Cork um, a number of years later, having lived, you know, a, a really interesting life, I imagine, in France. And she came back to Cork and saw poverty. She saw um, the, what was happening in Cork. And in particular, what moved her was that there were really poor children, boys and girls, Catholic, who were forbidden to have education. And she saw the value, value of education herself. And she was moved to such a degree that she decided to, I suppose, go against convention, go against the laws and set up a little school in uh, just literally on the site where I am here now in Nananagle Place. And the story goes on from there. She set up seven schools and went on to set up the Presentation Sisters, which are in 20 countries around the world. now. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, so I would love to hear more about the continuation of this, this legacy, you know, um, uh, in doing some of the research, reading the submissions for Best in Heritage, you describe Nano Nagel Place as starting um, as as an education and social justice place, of course, from this history, from the woman herself and her history, um, and then becoming a museum for modern times. And so I'm curious, you kind of describe it as a museum in reverse. So yeah. I'd love to hear more about the programming, about the ways that you engage community in the space. And I imagine that is a large part, if not the main part, of course, what the jury was impressed for, for the Council of Europe Museum Prize. So I'd love to hear more about how those weave together in the work you do today. Absolutely, Sarah, yeah. I mean, I suppose, like I said, the, the initiation and the ethos was all built upon education, inclusion, and this sense of um, social justice. So when um, the Presentation Sisters set about redeveloping this whole site, uh, there was a real commitment that there had to be, the ethos had to be consistently running through all aspects of it. So the museum tells the story of Nano Nagel and the Presentation Sisters, and it tells the story of 18th century Cork. But all other aspects of the site here had to, you know, align with that. So uh, we have what we would describe as a social justice and education hub where we have a number of projects. So, for example, we have a project called the Cork Migrant uh, Centre, which works with refugees, works with asylum seekers, works with migrants. So we have people from all over African countries, from Middle Eastern countries. We have people coming to us from Ukraine now at the moment. And they're, you know, getting service delivery, they're getting support, they're getting, you know, help with learning the language, with accessing, accessing services. So in a sense, it's bringing the vision of Nananagel Place back in the 1750s and 60s, responding to what she saw as a social injustice to right now, here we are in the 21st century. 
what are the things that we need to respond to know? So that's one example. But we have other we have another project called the Lantern Project, which works with vulnerable members of the community around here in Cork who come in here as well, come to Nananaga Place for courses, for support, and so on. And I suppose the, the third thing that we also kind of pride ourselves here in Nananaga Place, Sarah, is like I mentioned, education, inclusion, but a sense of welcoming and a sense of compassion. So, so the people who come in to interact with the social justice side of things very much, they love the place. They love coming here. They love that sense of feeling welcomed and getting support. So that is really an essential part of what Nananagle Place is all about. Absolutely. I, I love that. And it, it is kind of the, a museum, as you said, for modern times, for the needs of the current moment, um, which is how museums we have we have to be in order to survive, thrive, be relevant for our communities, right? Um, so mm-hmm. amazing work. I would love to hear more about some of the challenges and some of the joys and successes in in creating this space um, within Nanonagel Place, creating your community hub, your Lantern project. What are the challenges? What are the the successes of your journey? Yeah, so I suppose uh, one of the I suppose one of the initial challenges was. Um, even before the site was launched in 2017, 2018, you can imagine, and I think it's worth reflecting upon the the actual size of the project. So previous to it becoming Nananagle Place, I mean, it was uh, schools that closed in 2006. It was still this three and a half acre site, but, you know, it was becoming derelict, but there were a lot of, you know, protected buildings. So what could be done with the site? So the the initial vision of the Presentation Sisters and the voluntary board that they got in to kind of turn this into what it is today, you know, was really staggering because where it came from and what all the buildings are being used for, and I'll I'll talk maybe a little bit to that in a minute, Sarah, but like that initial kind of vision and like taking that on was a huge project. So there were lots of challenges in that development phase, but move forward then to 2017, 2018 and the launch of the site, Still, you know, massive challenges because it's in a really historic, beautiful part of the city, but it's a little bit, you know, outside the city. You know, not it's it's in the city, but a little bit outside. So even bringing people here, they would have associated Nananaga Place with schools. So bringing them in to know what was no um, this, you know, multifaceted site with a museum, with a design shop, with social justice projects, with beautifully re-landscaped gardens, with uh, you know a cafe that is committed to sustainability, also not forgetting what you know they completely um, kind of redesigned the whole site uh, from the perspective of how Nana Nagel herself and um, how she is kind of remembered. So they they moved her remains to a beautifully redesigned, um, I suppose, grave or tomb, and that whole area now is a very reflective kind of I suppose sacred space. And, and is beautifully situated down by the contemplative gardens. So, but getting people up here was a big thing. So the team um, at the time, they did a lot by way of cultural events and brought, you know, music, art, culture, poetry, as well, obviously, as the museum. But I think the team at the time realized that this has to appeal to lots of people, to bring people in for them to experience the site. So, so, so that was challenging, but like over time, people... And I suppose to turn it into a positive, then people have really recognized Nananaga Place now in Cork. It has what I would describe as a really strong brand. And we're really excited, especially on the back of winning this award, to continue to invite more people in Cork. But beyond, um, you know, tourists who come to Ireland to come down here and experience the site and all it has to offer. That's amazing. And, and that is one of the questions I was curious about as you were speaking is that journey from 2006 to today. How the the citizens of Cork, how they see Nano Nago Place, what are what do they think about? One of the things I love to do when I travel is ask, say, cab drivers or Lyft or Uber yeah. drivers, you know, have you heard of this place or what do you think about this place? How do you think if I hopped into a lift to head over to Nano Nago Place? How do you think the driver, if I said, what do you think about Nano Nago Place? How do you think they'd respond? 
now. Well, you know, if you if, like, it's such it's it's I, anytime I travel as well, it's the cab drivers, right? You know, they oh, they know more yeah. than so many people, right? But um, yeah, no, I I think like <laughs> cab drivers in Cork know the history of Cork, so they would absolutely know. Oh my God, yeah, that's where the schools were, and they would know like that that it's been redeveloped, and there is a real sense of pride around what is no Nananaga place because. Even though I mentioned it's a little bit, out, when I say outside, only like literally a mile or so outside the city centre, but it's in such a historic, historic part of the city on Douglas Street. And I mean, in a sense, it's wholly appropriate that that's where the schools were 250 years ago. And this, this part of the city is still kind of alive and kicking. And there are also other really culturally very important kind of sites very close to us so i think you know they would they would describe it as oh my god like it's been completely redeveloped it's a beautiful place when i talked to anyone when i when i told my doctor that i was working here he was like i love that place i love going in there i love the gardens but one of the things about the site i think sarah that's really interesting is there's so much going on here and we try to make everything going on somewhat integrated but people come for many different reasons you know people would come to the site and they would say, come to the beautiful gardens just to sit here and listen to the birds. When I come into work in the morning, first thing I do is open my window and just listen to the bird song. It's so beautiful. But like, and there you walk past the museum on the way, you walk past our mural on our diversity project where we brought all the different participants in our um, social justice projects together. And there's a beautiful mural just as you enter the site. So you get a sense of what's going on from a social justice perspective. You see the museum. If you want to visit the museum, you can visit the museum. Or if you just want to go to the gardens or down to our contemplative garden. So it has this holistic appeal to people. And I think that the way I would describe it is people are very proud of what it's become. And, and a lot of that has to do with where it's come from, I think. Absolutely. The tie, the tie to history is wonderful. Um, I would love to hear you. you know, you've touched a lot on the many layers of Nano Nago Place, the gardens, the programming, the, the historic buildings. So there's been much historic preservation to save the spaces and renovate mm. them, keep them for the future. Um, can you talk about how these many aspects and layers of what Nano Nago Place, how do you kind of fit it under one uh, overarching umbrella and theme? And then also, how do you determine and kind of you know keep your your finger out on the pulse of what the community needs at the moment to to meet that mission it's such a good question you know and 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 i think thinking about the buildings is actually a good entry point to kind of to reflect and to respond to that question sarah because i mean when you come into the site like um the first thing you do is you come into the design shop right so it's 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 a design shop with lots of different products locally produced and it's an entry point aesthetically it's beautiful you come up the stairs then and you're immediately struck by images of the social justice projects but the site was redeveloped with a, a pathway which they which the the designers called the spine of the of the redevelopment so this pathway walks right through the center of the site but on your right hand side is the first building um, which I, which is called the 1771 building, right? Because it was there since 1771. And in that building is the staff, my own team here. We have all the social justice projects are housed here. We have meeting rooms that community groups or other charities love to come and use because the site is so beautiful. And we have all that coming together. And this is the place, this is really the hub, right? Because mm -hmm. there's so many people coming and going and the energy of the place is amazing. When you hear people coming in and you hear music classes or, you know, you hear the women who come in to do crochet or you hear the asylum seekers coming in, the mothers and toddlers group and the noise of the children, you really get a sense of, my God, this, this is really the pulse of the place. And, you know, um, when you think back 250 years, you would think that, Nana Nagel would be, you know, proud of, of that aspect of it. And then you turn to the left and of the 1771 building, and there's the museum. And that and this is the museum is in what was the chapel, the Goldie Chapel, completely redeveloped. So a beautiful site. You walk into the permanent museum and you have the temporary um, um, exhibitions that come and go, which are really exciting as well. And it's in the same chapel that just last week, the Cork International Choral Festival was here. So we had people, uh, choirs from France, from Finland in here. So you get a sense straight away of, all right, and, and I'm going to come to your question, how we knit it all together, because I think it's a brilliant question. But if you come out of that building and you go back down towards the entrance a bit, 
the, the first primary school, which is there since 1928, that is now completely redeveloped into a conference space where, for example, just a few weeks ago, the European Writers Club had their annual conference here. So, which was the, to see them all around the site and going to the cafe and sitting out in the gardens was brilliant. But again, you get a sense of the type of organizations we like to have in here, the sense of creativity, of social justice, you know, that that melds across all of the work. But in the same building, which was the primary school, the top two floors are rented out by the physiotherapy department in University College Cork, their master's program. So again, you've got education there, you know, alive and well, students coming in and out. And then the largest building over to the left um, is the U University College Cork and the Munster Technological University of uh, Architecture. So that was actually the schoolyard and that was completely designed and redeveloped where now you have the, the most well-known College of Architecture in Cork right here on our site. So you get a sense of the people coming in, they're coming in for education and um, the people who come to our social justice projects are coming for education, for social inclusion, for activism. And the people who come to the museum want to learn about the roots, want to learn about an amazing story of a pioneer, pioneering woman who challenged the social injustice of our time. And then we have school groups coming in then who we pose the challenge. So what are you going to do today? So you have all of that happening in this one space. So that that's, I think, what makes it a bit unique and a bit exciting. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think it speaks to the vibrancy of what happens when you can blend history and community and relevance and serving community all in one place. It, it It's magic, right? It's, yes, it's, a, yeah. it's a magical combination. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. I would love just to, um, I think I sort of have kind of one more place. We talked about the buildings, which is great. It's a large campus which, with all of these things. Um, one of the curiosities I have, there's many, many things I've heard that are impressive, but is there anything in your mind you think that particularly stood out to the, the prize jury for the Council of Europe Museums prize that they, they kind of reflected back to you in your work that, that stood out for them? Yeah, I think so. And I think you alluded to it earlier, Sarah, when, you know, when we think of museology and we think of the importance of social and political issues and the role museums play in contemporary times. So I do think, and we saw this in some of the feedback from the judges, the way in which we work and continue to work hard to bring that social justice, that, that work that is contemporary, that is with communities in our community, that is with those who are vulnerable, that is with those who are joining our community from other countries for the first time. The way we look to connect that with the story in the museum, I think, was, was something that certainly they were taken by. And we were able to give examples of, for, for example, we have the Diversity Academy, where we brought together asylum seekers and refugees with people in our Lantern Project, vulnerable communities, and people who had come from Ukraine most recently. And we took some artifacts from the museum around embroidery from the 19th century, and we created workshops around the meaning of home. So connecting, as you said, the past with the present. And then out of that as well, I mentioned earlier, the mural that is now one of the most, uh, I suppose, prominent visuals when you come into the site, when you come up to the top of the stairs, there's a mural that was an output from that project there. And also um, what we have done in the museum, Sarah, is in where we host the temporary exhibitions, we have created these pillars with videos and images of the social justice projects. So someone comes into the museum, they're, they're learning about 18th century Cork and they're learning about Nananagel and they move into the next space, which brings them into the present and they bring, brings them into the social justice projects. And we have integrated that as well into the, the app and the audio tour and to the guided tours. So I think they saw that we really want to bring the past and the future together and to make the site relevant to people today. Congratulations, that's fantastic. I have one final question. Mm -hmm. If you uh, were to give advice to someone, to a, a, a fellow CEO or, or um, museum team that wants to do this beautiful blend of mm -hmm. connecting the history of a place to community, to helping find that relevance, to move towards being that museum of the future, what advice would you give them? I think one of the things that uh, the, I suppose the, 
the founders, the, the people who initiated the vision for Nanonagle Place. One of the things that I really respect and I think they got so right was they set about being very clear on the ethos from the start. And they set about having ideas that weren't too many, but that were powerful. So when they said this place is about education, it's, it's a sacred space. It's a sacred place where people can come for time out, where they will always feel welcome and when, where there's social inclusion, everyone is welcome. And I think when you get that ethos right from the start and to something you said earlier, anything that's done thereafter, any ex- expansion or evolution of the work, it has to reflect that. And I think that would be the thing I would say, if you get that right, you know, your, your compass or your North Star then I think, you know, it makes everything else easier. Absolutely. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate your time today. It was delightful to hear about your wonderful organization. I wish you best of luck in all your future endeavors. And I can't wait to follow what's happening next. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Really enjoyed it. Thanks a million.